Well, hi, my name is Erica Kleiderman. I'm a lawyer by training and an academic associate at the Center of Genomics and Policy at McGill University. And today I'll be talking to you about re-examining the ethical and regulatory dimensions of gene editing in the wake of the CRISPR baby scandal. So to provide you with an overview of what I plan to cover today, um, I'll start off by giving you a brief overview of human germline genome editing. Then we'll move on to look at the international legal and policy landscape. I'll then present um, some of the ethical failures in the aftermath of the CRISPR baby scandal. Then I'll move on to talk about, well, what's the impact for Canada? And I'll conclude by considering, well, where do we go from here? And what is the feasibility of a moratorium in this context? So when we talk about CRISPR-Cas9, one of my favorite analogies is to think of it as a word processing tool. So for example, if you're proofreading a document for typos, you can think of CRISPR as the tool that enables you to search for the typo, then once found, cut or remove the typo, and then replace it with the correct word. So based on this analogy, CRISPR can identify the mutated gene, remove it, and replace it with a healthy version of that gene, thus potentially treating or preventing a slew of genetic diseases. Now, gene editing technologies have been around for years, so it's not new, but what CRISPR-Cas9 does bring to the table is that it offers a more affordable or cheaper option, uh, it's easier to use, and it's purportedly more accurate than other technologies such as zinc fingers or talons. So gene editing can be used to cure patients. So here we can think of, for example, somatic cell therapies. It can be used to create genetically healthy individuals. So this is where we can think about human germline modification. So editing embryos to ensure that they're born healthy. And then the third, the third possibility is to enhance non-medical physical and mental characteristics. However, this is the more contentious aspect. And there's general consensus that we should not be uh, using this technology for enhancement purposes. So I thought this was a great slide to sort of compare and contrast uh, somatic gene editing versus germline gene editing. So when we talk about somatic gene ed editing, these are edits that will target a specific type of cell. So for example, blood cells. That means that any edits that are made will be specific to that targeted cell and any changes will remain with that given individual. So there's no chance of the edits being passed on to future generations. Also, when we talk about somatic cell therapies, these have been around for quite some time. And so they're generally in a highly regulated context. Versus when we talk about germline gene editing, since the edits are being made so early uh, in the, the embryo development process or to sperm and eggs, so the gametes, it will, uh, any edits that are made will impact all new cells. So that means, so as mentioned, every cell will be impacted by the edit. And this raises the concerns surrounding the possibility that these changes will be passed on to future generations. And so within this context, they raise a slew of new legal and societal considerations moving forward. So why is human germline genome editing so controversial? Well, first we've got ethical and social issues. So under this category, we'll find the idea of the human hubris, or the idea of playing God. And then there's also the potential impact on societal perceptions and attitudes towards individuals living with disabilities. There are also legal and policy challenges. So as I mentioned on the previous slide, there are new considerations that arise with regards to how do we regulate this technology? And then it also raises the question of just because we can do something, should we? And finally, there's the meaning of genetics in our culture. So the idea of genetic relatedness as the basis of family relationships, genetics as the basis of health and disease, the idea of the heritage of humanity. So the human genome is not static, but dynamic and evolves naturally over time. And then the concept of genetic exceptionalism, so that our genes require special protections or regulations. Now, what are some overarching ethical, legal, and social issues that arise in the context of germline modification? So first, we've got safety and uncertainty of the technology. So this idea of crossing the germline barrier. We then have the notion of risks for future generations. 
So the possible irrevocable and unforeseen uh, implications down the line. There's also the notion of the preservation of human diversity and individuality. The respect for individuals' reproductive freedom. So individuals' choice to access this technology or use this technology or not. It also raises questions about enhancement, which ultimately can lead to social justice issues, such as new forms of inequality, discrimination, and societal conflict. So under this, uh, the umbrella of social justice, we'll also see the notion of equitable access to the therapy. So ensuring that those who would really require or benefit most from the technology have access, and that it's not just being used by those, um, the richest among us. It also raises concerns surrounding the need to protect the welfare of children born from this technology and the need for potential long-term monitoring and follow-up to ensure that these children are healthy down the line. And then the need for meaningful and substantial public engagement, which is something that will come up throughout my presentation. So this slide provides you with a uh, a brief overview of the CRISPR timeline, beginning with the publication of a Chinese study using gene editing on non-viable human embryos um, to study or work towards treating beta thalassemia. So this was published back in April of 2015, and it was the catalyst for international debates surrounding the use of CRISPR-Cas9 for reproductive purposes and for the treatment and prevention of diseases. So following this, in December of 2015, the first international summit on human genome modification was held in Washington. And so what was concluded from this meeting was really that it would be irresponsible to move forward with clinical applications of germline editing, and the fear being its reproductive uses. And what we can see from this timeline is that essentially it took three years before a scientist actually uh, went through with using germline modification for reproductive purposes. I'll come back to the, that a little bit later. And so if we look at the top of, um, well, the images and events that occurred above the arrow, we can see an evolution in terms of the science. So in February of 2016, we had the first license that was granted by the Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority in the UK to Dr. Kathy Nyakin to use gene editing on healthy embryos um, with the purpose of better understanding non-implantation and miscarriage. Similar studies have also taken place in Sweden. We then had in August of 2017, the US study that was published by Dr. Metalopov, whereby he used gene editing to correct a serious heritable heart condition in healthy embryos that were also destroyed within the 14 day window. And so what resulted from this study was that we were beginning to generate and address safety and efficacy concerns surrounding germline editing, albeit in the research context. So all the studies up to this point have really focused on research purposes of this technology. And then we had in November of 2018, Dr. Ha um, announced the birth of the CRISPR twin girls. Um, so babies who had been genetically genetically modified using germline modification. And this was announced two days before the second international summit on human genome modification. And then if we look at the events that took place um, at the bottom of the arrow or in the lower half of the screen, what we can see is a progression of statements and reports that have come out surrounding uh, genome editing more broadly. So in February of 2017, we had the National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine that came out with their report. Then in July 2018, we had the Nuffield Council on Bioethics. And then in November of 2018, we had the statement that resulted from the Second International Summit on Human Genome Modification. And so essentially what we see across these three reports is an opening towards the possibility of using germline modification in the context of clinical trials, provided that stringent criteria are met and that rigorous oversight is in place. And the last two bullets on, uh, on the timeline allude to the creation of two uh, commissions or committees to look at this issue more broadly. And I'll come back to all of these points throughout my presentation. So now moving on to the international legal and policy challenges. So at least 61 ethics reports and statements by more than 50 countries and organizations have been published since 2015 and approximately 11% seem to be open to the possibility of allowing clinical applications of heritable genome editing under certain conditions. 
So this map is a comparative legal and policy analysis across a sample of 16 countries that was published in Science back in 2016. And what it does is it provides a global snapshot of the regulatory and policy approaches adopted by these countries across six different technologies. And so I'm gonna draw your attention to the map in the top left-hand corner, so on human germline genetic modification. And what we see here is essentially a patchwork of regulatory landscapes, whereby some countries adopt a more restrictive approach, so whether it be via criminal ban, and other countries adopting a much more permissive approach uh, with regards to the regulation of germline modification. And something that we need to keep in mind here is that what we're trying to do with these regulations, policies, and laws is really regulate the risks and uncertainties of this novel disruptive technology. And so generally, uh, when we consider legal and policy approaches that are adopted to regulate human germline modification, there are three that come up. The first is a statutory approach. So this would include criminal law or moratoria that are enshrined in law. The second is a regulatory approach. So this is the existence of oversight mechanisms. And the third is a policy approach. So this essentially entails guidelines. And so the 17 countries that will be on the next slide um, actually stem from the citation at the bottom of this slide. So it's a forthcoming book that's looking at human and germline genome modification and the right to science. And it's essentially a comparative study of national laws and policies. So what we can see here is that most countries do adopt a statutory approach with the exception of China. And whether it be through criminal law, civil law, or a moratorium that's enshrined in law, as is the case for Israel. Most of these countries also adopt a regulatory approach. So they've got a national regulatory authority that's mandated with reviewing and providing approval for the conduct of specific research. And this can be a licensing body, an advisory committee, or a research ethics board. And finally, we can see that fewer countries adopt a policy approach. But what I did want to um, bring to your attention was that if we look at China, they're the only country surveyed that adopts solely a regulatory and policy approach, so more of a soft law approach to the regulation of human germline modification. And so I'm going to spend the next few slides um, talking about those reports that I presented on the timeline. And so the first one is the National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine's report on human genome editing that was published in February of 2017. And I want to draw your attention to two points that were made. So the first is with regards to germline genome editing. So this report um, gave germline modification a yellow light, meaning that it would be permissible for clinical research trials to take place only for compelling purposes of treating or preventing serious diseases or disabilities, and only if there's a stringent oversight system um, that's able to limit uses to specific criteria. So basically, you've got that stringent oversight system in place, and you've got uh, a specific set of criteria that must be met. And the other point I wanted to draw your attention to was with regards to human enhancement. So the National Academies essentially stated that we should not proceed at this time with human genome editing for purposes other than treatment and prevention of disease and disabilities. And they encourage public discussion on somatic genome editing for other uses. So I had mentioned that the National Academies had put forward a list of criteria. And so this is just a snapshot of a few criteria that would need to be met. The list is much more exhaustive. But these criteria include, for example, the absence of reasonable alternatives, so using human germline modification only as a last resort when all else fails, the need for ongoing rigorous oversight during clinical trials, and the need for comprehensive plans for long-term multi-generational follow-up. So as mentioned, this is just a snapshot of the criteria that would need to be met if human germline modification were to be allowed uh, within a, the context of clinical trials. And so one point I wanted to, to bring forward was this possible shift from the notion of human germline modification being irresponsible to permissible that occurred between the 2015 First International Summit on Human Genome Editing and the publication in 2017 of the National Academies of Sciences um, and Engineering and Medicine's report. So in the International Summit Statement in 2015, 
they deemed that it would be irresponsible to proceed with any clinical use of germline editing unless and until one, the relevant safety and efficacy issues have been resolved, and two, there's broad societal consensus about the appropriateness of the proposed application. So basically in 2015, what we see is that the moral line is drawn between the approach or technology. So it's a question of somatic genome editing versus germline modification. And then when we shift over to the 2017 report, uh, they state that clinical trials using heritable germline genome editing could one day be permitted for serious conditions provided specific criteria are met and stringent oversight is in place. So here we can see a shift in the moral line um, towards the application or the purpose of the technology. So we're talking about germline modification, but the distinction to be made is between, is it being used for therapeutic purposes or for enhancement purposes? The next report uh, I wanted to present was that of the Nuffield Council on Bioethics, which was published in July of 2018. And so as laid out in their recent report, heritable genome editing is not unacceptable in itself. That is, it may become morally acceptable in time, but we do need a responsible path forward. So if germline modification were to be permitted, it should be strictly regulated by the Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority, for example, in the UK. It should be introduced only in the context of a clinical study with monitoring of the long-term effects on individuals and groups. So within a well-controlled context, and it should be licensed on a case-by-case -case basis, so not a free-for-all. And a further recommendation that's put forward is the need to establish an independent body in the UK to promote broad and inclusive societal debate on heritable genome editing interventions and related scientific and medical developments. And the final statement I'm going to present is that stemming from the second international summit on human uh, genome editing that came out in November of 2018. So what we see here is that with regards to basic and preclinical research, the statement suggests that this should be permitted as it will enable a better understanding and design of the techniques. The statement also proposes a translational pathway forward that will require adhering to widely accepted standards for clinical research and establishing standards for preclinical evidence and accuracy. So this need for a rigorous and responsible path forward. Uh, they maintain that it would be irresponsible to use human germline modification in the context of reproductive purposes or, or clinical purposes. And they call for this, uh, for this need for an ongoing international forum and the need to foster broad public dialogue. So now what I wanted to present in the next few slides are really some ethical shortcomings or failures that arose in the aftermath of the CRISPR baby scandal. So as mentioned earlier on, um, the announcement of the birth of genetically modified twin girls in China was done a couple days before the second international summit in Hong Kong, and it was announced via a YouTube video. And so essentially what happened was that this researcher, Dr. He, had used germline modification on the embryos to render them HIV resistant, so modified the CCR5 gene, so to render them resistant to a specific strain of HIV. Uh, in this context, it was a healthy mother and an HIV father, and it was presented as a clinical trial. So what I wanna do now is demonstrate how facts from the CRISPR babies situation or scandal actually map onto these longstanding and well-established principles of ethical clinical research. If we were to consider the issue of social or scientific value, so there was a lack of compliance with Chinese regulations and a violation of international consensus to hold off on clinical applications of human germline gene editing. In terms of scientific validity, there was a lack of transparency in Dr. He's work as in it was not published or peer reviewed and the same goes for prior animal studies that he had conducted. With regards to fair subject selection, it was alleged, there was alleged undue inducement of parents to participate in the clinical trial as they were promised up to $42,000 to cover any costs that are related with um, medical treatment or medical care. In terms of the favorable risk benefit ratio, 
Well, the choice of gene is not medically justified. So it was not a clear life-threatening disease or condition and approved methods of prevention already exist, such as sperm washing. So in this context, there was no rationale or medical rationale to use germline modification since other options were readily available. In terms of independent review, there was a lack of valid ethics approval from an institutional review board, and Dr. Hez's institution allegedly was unaware of the clinical trials taking place. In terms of informed consent, there was a lack of a valid and acceptable informed consent form. So the consent form was long, over 23 pages. It was also written in a lot of scientific jargon, so not um, easily accessible or or written in lay terms for the parents to understand. And there was misinformation that was presented to the parents. So this was presented as an AIDS vaccine trial likely to benefit their children, which was not in fact the case. And finally, if we think about respect for potential and enrolled subjects, Dr. He failed to disclose his conflicts of interest to participants in the trial. And the final point I wanted to raise here was that Dr. He had also informed several peers about his plans, yet none sufficiently intervened to discourage him from following through. So the question of where does the responsibility lie comes up in this context. Now, stemming from the CRISPR baby scandal, uh, there are four common themes that will come up as an ethical critique. So the first is the specter of eugenics. So this is common regarding any genetic innovations, and it's a reminder of the need to discuss proposed genetic interventions prospectively or ahead of time. So what's our target? What's our goal? Where do we draw the line? What would be permissible? And this then ties into the second theme, that of risks to future children and parental freedoms. So there were the high risks um, in this study or in this clinical trial were not justified in the context as reproductive autonomy and desires of biological parenthood took precedence over the consideration of possible health risks to the children. A third theme is the failure of professional self-regulation, which will assume a lack of professional codes of conduct. However, this is a false assumption, as it was not the absence of self-regulatory mechanisms, but of the implementation of China's existing guidelines and regulations that were not adhered to in this context. And the final theme is that of the chilling effect. So this is the fear that legitimate progress will be stifled. According to Francis Collins, should such epic scientific misadventures proceed, a technology with enormous promise for prevention and treatment of disease will be overshadowed by justifiable public outrage, fear, and disgust. Now, another ethical concern that arose in this context was the possibility that the CRISPR twins might have had their brains inadvertently enhanced. So new research shows that the deletion of the CCR5 gene makes mice smarter and improves human brain recovery after stroke, which could be linked to greater success in school, so a form of cognitive enhancement. Now, the question that comes up here is, what will the effects be on the girl's cognition? And this is something that is impossible to predict at this time. A recent article that had been published considering this question of, well, is enhancement the price of prevention, states that science policymakers will need to think more carefully about what prevention might mean in the gene editing context and develop research governance that can anticipate and address the human enhancement concerns it will raise. So if the scope of acceptable clinical research is expanded to include preventive strengthening interventions, the door is open to protocols that raise enhancement concerns. So balancing the health gains of prevention against the social costs of enhancement will require scientific reflection as well as social wisdom. Now, how could we possibly mitigate such ethical breaches? So the first would be to put an emphasis on ethical and responsible research norms and processes. A second would be to adopt appropriate enforcement and oversight mechanisms. A third would be to develop a common groundwork, so shared values and principles, both internationally and try to harmonize across cultures and countries. There's also the need to align with local preferences and longstanding ethical principles and practices. And finally, the idea of a research ethics consultation system and process that's geared towards human participants 
in the context of cutting edge clinical research. And so in this context, it's important not just to seek harmonization of ethical policies worldwide, but also to seriously consider how countries like China, which are aggressively seeking to become leaders in cutting edge and often controversial fields, can develop local research ethics frameworks that align with both local preferences, as well as longstanding and well-established ethical principles and practices. So what are some of the steps that have been taken by China following this scandal? So China has aimed to further strengthen their ethics governance by creating a national medical ethics committee that would be tasked with approving all clinical trials involving high-risk biomedical technology. China has also put forward new draft regulations that restrict the use of human genome editing, which is considered to be high risk, and would require the approval by Chinese authorities and ethics committees prior to being permitted to proceed to clinical trials. So these regulations call for greater oversight and accountability on the part of health institutions regarding the clinical trials taking place within their institutions. And the, the draft regulations can also result in penalties for the researchers, uh, whether it be fines, lifetime bans, criminal investigations, or the revocation of licenses. Back in March of 2019, 18 scientists and ethicists from seven countries put forward a call to adopt a moratorium on heritable genome editing. And so they proposed a five-year moratorium on clinical applications of germline modification. They state that by global moratorium, they don't mean a permanent ban, but rather they call for the establishment of an international framework in which nations, while retaining the right to make their own decisions, voluntarily commit to not approve any use of clinical germline editing unless certain conditions are met. Now, a binding global moratorium would bring with it concerns as to its feasibility and its ability to be operationalized, as well as it might even stifle necessary public debate. So the questions that arise here have to do with, well, would a moratorium really be effective? How would we actually implement and enforce it? And most countries already criminally prohibit germline modification for clinical purposes. So what does a moratorium actually add? Then one month later, a letter signed by more than 60 American scientists, CEOs, and bioethicists was sent to the secretary of the US Department of Health and Human Services, calling for a binding global moratorium, limiting clinical testing of germline gene editing in humans, and the need for effective and easily accessible mechanisms for reporting potential violations. I do wanna point out that although a good portion of the letter uh, alludes to this need for a global moratorium on germline editing, the latter half of the letter is more of a plea to continue to support and advance somatic gene therapies, so any non-germline correction. Furthermore, we've got uh, the World Health Organization Expert Advisory Committee on Developing Global Standards for Governance and Oversight of Human Gene Editing um, that was established in December of 2018. And so their first step was really a call for a global registry of studies on human genome editing. And as we can see by the headline at the bottom um, of this slide, uh, the World Health Organization Expert Advisory Committee has approved the first phase of a new global registry. So it has launched, so we see forward movement. And ultimately the goal of the WHO committee is to work towards a strong, comprehensive global governance framework for responsible stewardship of human genome editing. In a similar line, we also have the newly established International Commission on Clinical Use of Heritable Human Genome Editing, which was established in May of 2019. And um, the focus of this commission, however, is a bit more towards the clinical applications of human germline genome editing and to further inform a potential translational path towards the clinic. Now, if we move on to consider, well, what is the impact of all of this for Canada more specifically? Well, in Canada, germline modification and, and somatic gene editing are um, overseen or fall under the purview of the Assisted Human Reproduction Act, which is a piece of criminal legislation, as well as under the Tri-Council Policy Statement, or TCPS2, uh, which essentially governs um, research involving humans to ensure that it's being conducted in an ethical manner. 
So germline modification is prohibited under Article 51F of the Assisted Human Reproduction Act, which states that no person shall knowingly alter the genome of a cell of a human being or in vitro embryo such that the alteration is capable of being transmitted to descendants. And anyone found guilty of this is liable of a fine up to $500,000, imprisonment up to 10 years, or both. So quite draconian sanctions if you, um, if you go against this law. So in the wake of the CRISPR babies, well, what does this mean for science in Canada? So Canada's criminal prohibition of basic research using human germline modification is unnecessarily restrictive. So we need a renewed Canadian conversation. A potential example of this or, or way forward would be a democratic engagement process of public consultation that could potentially be led by Health Canada. There's also a need to reorient our models of governance of emerging biotechnologies to shift away from criminal law towards regulations, perhaps. There's also a need to strengthen scientific literacy about human genetic research and reproductive medicine to enable ongoing review of Canadian laws and policies. And there's a need for an independent review body that's charged with guiding ongoing reforms to the Assisted Human Reproduction Act and the TCPS2 in light of emergent technologies. And one point that I wanted to make was the criminal prohibition on human germline modification in Canada is both in a research context, so basic research could not be done, as well as in a clinical context. And so this is where our major concern is, the, the conflation of those two contexts under criminal law. And so ultimately, an inclusive approach to policymaking is needed that recognizes a variety of opinions and voices. And this can be seen through the consensus statement. So this resulted from a series of workshops on prohibited research activities that aimed at developing recommendations for reform. So this was led by our center as well as collaborators across Canada. And essentially what we see stemming from this consensus statement is the right of Canadians to benefit from the advancement of science, the need to avoid criminal bans on research, um, a need for proportional policy making, and then the need to distinguish between research and clinical context. Uh, with regards to germline modification and other prohibited activities under the Assisted Human Reproduction Act. Following the consensus statement, a series of consultations with stakeholders and end users were held, which resulted in this recently published paper that proposes pragmatic reforms in support of research. So what we propose is a tailored regulatory carve-out for in vitro research for currently prohibited activities under the Assisted Human Reproduction Act, and for the exercise of ministerial discretion for access by Canadians to experimental in vivo interventions that are currently prohibited. Uh, and all of this would be overseen by a new national agency, similar to the Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority in the UK, or one that's modeled on a blend of the Canadian Stem Cell Oversight Committee and what was the Assisted Human Reproduction uh, Canada. Another point that we need to consider, as we saw in the statements I presented earlier on, it seems this notion of serious appears in terms of considerations of what would be permissible applications of human germline modification. So generally, we, we seem to see that it would be permissible for the treatment or prevention of serious uh, genetic disorders. However, nowhere has this notion of serious been classified or defined, making its application rather vague. So this is something we'll need to consider moving forward. How do we define it? Do we need to define it? And what would criteria be that would help us um, better understand and apply it? So now, where do we go from here? Well, if we consider public attitudes, it appears to be the application rather than the technology itself that is the critical issue for the public. The nature of support for gene editing is complex and determined by the application, the type of cell, and also individual differences. And what they've also found is that there seems to be significantly higher support amongst males, younger people, and those reporting lower religiosity, more knowledge, and stronger trust in science. The next point is, as I had alluded to uh, earlier on, is the right to enjoy the benefits of science and its applications. So this was first recognized in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights back in 1948 under Article 27.1, which states that everyone has the right to freely participate 
and to share in scientific advancements and its benefits. This right was later enshrined in Article 15b of the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights in 1966. And essentially, it can be seen as a means through which scientific advances, having a positive impact on human health, can be promoted and shared for the benefit of all. It's also a right that has remained largely dormant and its scope and normative content poorly elaborated within the literature. And it's only really in the last decade that we're seeing a reawakening of this right. Um, I wanted to include this quote by Eric Youngst that states, the goal of such a novel human rights approach is to reorient our conversation from policing science to governing society and would shift our focus from avoiding risks to protecting opportunities. So this idea of trying to apply a human rights approach to the idea of human germline editing. And ultimately, this would foster advancements in our ability to treat and prevent disease while remaining mindful of the need to establish anticipatory governance that provides the necessary flexibility to frame the preventive or therapeutic applications, but also adapt to potentially legitimate off-label ones. A next point to consider are the rights of future generations. So the Oviedo Convention explicitly prohibited modification of the human genome. It maintained that preventive, diagnostic, or therapeutic purposes are recognized as legitimate only if their aim is not to introduce any modification in the genome of any descendants. And it also recognizes that scientific progress should be used for the benefit of present and future generations. This notion of protecting future generations and their interests was further enshrined in the 1997 Declaration on the Responsibilities of the Present Generation Towards Future Generations and in the 2005 Universal Declaration on Bioethics and Human Rights. This notion of the rights of future generations have also been incorporated into national documents, such as the Constitution of Japan and the Nuffield Council on Bioethics latest report. So in line with the rights of future generations is also this notion of intergenerational monitoring. So as mentioned, in the Nuffield Council on Bioethics 2018 report, they raised the idea of transgenerationalism and questions surrounding the responsibility and obligations to both the next generation and future generations. There's also Quebec's Commission on Ethics and Science and Technology's 2019 report that proposes adopting a precautionary approach. So to ensure that appropriate measures and mechanisms are in place specifically considering potential irrevocable and unforeseen consequences of human germline modification on future generations. Some examples could be adopting stringent scientific standards or to limit potential clinical applications to very serious high penetrance diseases. So this idea of using it as a last resort or the development of an electronic register for longitudinal medical monitoring. Now, continuing on this notion, Although typical in research on new reproductive technologies, long-term follow-up has always been limited to the parents and their direct descendants, and it provides little guidance on how to address the ethical participation of multiple generations. So long-term follow-up monitoring would be not just of participants in the original trial, but also their children and even grandchildren who were not part of the original consent process. And so this ultimately raises concerns about consent as a patient can provide consent, whereas a future child cannot. There's also the concern of rogue scientists and how do we prevent this from happening in the future? And so one proposition by Altachero was that an alter alternative approach is to take advantage of the ecosystem of regulatory actors and develop a roadmap for responsible translational research. Such guidance would include stringent criteria for use of germline editing and standards for determining whether these criteria have been met. And this would all be embedded within larger political structures that offer vehicles for public input. So the alternative approach um, suggests a sort of broader, more inclusive approach to, uh, to managing rogue scientists. Now, as I mentioned earlier on, Dr. He had informed several peers about his plans, yet none sufficiently intervened to discourage him from following through. Most scientists simply don't recognize an obligation to speak up. And so some reasons for this silence could be uncertainty over Dr. He's intentions or a reassurance that he had been dissuaded. There's also the possibility um, that they felt a sense of obligation to preserve confidentiality 
and the absence of a global oversight body. So ultimately, this science is a symptom of a broader scientific cultural crisis, a growing divide between the values upheld by the scientific community and the mission of science itself. So we need to be able to reflect on how our research fits into society. Ultimately, a fundamental goal of the scientific endeavor is to advance society through knowledge and innovation. The dominant values ingrained in scientists center on the virtues of independence, ambition, and objectivity. However, in decisions about how and whether this technology should be used, we will require an expanded set of scientific virtues, including compassion to ensure its applications are designed to be just, humility to ensure its risks are heeded, and altruism to ensure its benefits are equitably distributed. And so finally, this notion of open science, which aims to create new knowledge through global collaborations involving thousands of people from across the world and from all walks of life. So the goal being really to engage with citizens as active participants and facilitate open and accessible research. Ultimately, a well-informed, consulted and involved audience is more likely to support research and scientific progress. And so this need to make citizens active participants in scientific development was proposed over 21 years ago in the Avito Convention under Article 28. So now to conclude with considerations with um, about the feasibility of a moratorium. So one, it could be argued that an arbitrary moratorium does not further or foster the best interests or health of children or respect their right to access the advancements of science. In short, the recent calls for global moratoria are troubling in that they may create an illusion of control or of oversight of rogue science. They could silence what should be an ongoing and vigorous international debate surrounding a responsible translational path forward, and they would be paradoxical as legal prohibitions surrounding human germline editing already exist. And they would unwittingly reinforce the absence of a much needed examination of the actual and future interests of children. So a better and more realistic route may be to focus efforts on enforcing current laws, regulations and guidelines while fostering public dialogue through participative approaches. And ongoing enforcement by national authorities may be a more efficient use of time and resources in our goal of establishing a robust and ethically responsible framework moving forward. And so I want to end with this slide, which is um, the cover of Time magazine, I believe in January 2019, which uh, focuses on the future of babies. And so it looks at gene editing. And so the idea of, is the CRISPR baby controversy the start of a terrifying new chapter in gene editing? It considers uterus transplants. So the first successful uterus transplant from deceased donor leads to a healthy baby, which is actually the baby on the cover. And finally, three biological parents or mitochondrial replacement therapy and the possibility that reports of these babies are multiplying. So I believe at this point, at least 10 babies have been born using mitochondrial replacement therapy. However, the UK is the only country to have legally permitted use of this technology, but none of the babies that have been born have actually been born in the UK. So this raises two main points that I feel we need to consider moving forward. One is where to draw the line with enhancement or where do we draw lines in the sand at all in this context? And two, it raises concerns uh, or raises future concerns and considerations beyond gene editing. So the idea of re-engineering and a need to reframe assisted reproductive technologies as a whole. So on that note, I wanna thank you for your attention.